to have you here. Today, we're going to do a kitchen cabinet door sell, and I'm going to be co-presenting with Hunter Ellison. He's with our E-Tech department, and he does ancillary products like the Tiger Stop and Unique Machine and Tool. My name is Peter Van Dyke. I'm a product specialist. I do solid wood, solid wood systems, and sanding and veneering equipment. Back behind me, we have Jeremy from uh, Unique Machine and Tool. So if you have any questions about that equipment later on, you certainly can talk to him. We have Valentino from CML, the ripsaw company that we represent. If you have any questions, by all means, talk to Valentino. And then we have presenters, David, Gil, and Ryan. They'll be demonstrating the equipment as you see this cell uh, uh, go through its motions. So first we'll just do kind of an overview of what you're gonna see. Then we're gonna go into detail about the process. We're gonna be talking about ripping. We're gonna be talking about molding. We're gonna be talking about cross-cutting and optimizing material. Then we're gonna be talking about uh, coping the material, assembling the doors, and then finally shaping and sanding the doors in one process. Then we're gonna have a little section on door making, whether you should make doors, whether you should outsource them, or maybe do a little bit of both and talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about manufacturing considerations, um, things to think about, kind of takeaways, things that you've seen here, but things that you can come back to your own facilities and take a look and, and, and maybe some apply some new ideas that make sense for you guys. Then I have some basic layouts of different work cells that might be of interest to you guys. Um, and of course, uh, it could be, it could look a lot of different ways, but just some ideas that might be, uh, might be interesting. So basically what we're doing today is we're gonna take some lumber and we're gonna turn it into a five piece door. So the first step, we'll be working on the CML E350R, uh, moving blade rip saw, processing the rips. Then we're gonna move over to the Kentwood 509S and there will be profiling style and rail doors or style and rail components, uh, the lineal profile. And then uh, David will set up while these guys are operating the other equipment on face frame and then we'll run some face frame material at the end of the presentation. And we'll come over, uh, once we get past that portion of the presentation, we'll be running all of these machines together, but talking about them individually, starting with the upcut saw, the Ironwood upcut saw and the Tiger Stop. We'll also go into a little bit of detail about optimization and some different things there that could benefit your facilities. Jeremy will, will be working on the uh, coping machine, 310, unique. Ryan will be back there putting doors together and also face frames. Jeremy will be working uh, also on the 422 shaper, uh, shape and sand, and uh, processing the outside edge detail of the finished door. So what we'll do is we'll start now, we'll have Gil start to run some uh, product uh, through the rip saw, and we'll talk a little bit about the ripping process. It's an important, it's an important first step in the process. And of course, some of the things that we're thinking about when we're ripping are, what does my product need to be? Do I need to have a product that is ripped prior to a molding, a molding operation? Do I need that product to be able to go to a glue clamp? Do I need a glue line? Later on, we'll talk about what a glue line is so that we can ensure that we have a very nice joint so we don't have any issues with that. Um, the other thing that we think about when we talk about ripping is defecting. Defecting is different uh, in the ripping operation than the crosscut in the, in the sense that we're not quite as particular about the ripping uh, defect uh, process, but what we really want to accomplish is to try to isolate defects in one particular rip or another instead of spreading them up over multiple rips or multiple uh, pieces. Um, the other thing we, uh, we get involved in is the optimization. That particular saw has the ability to optimize the material so I can get the best use out of that. Uh, different rip uh, operations have different abilities and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. 
But the, mod the bottom line is what we're really trying to accomplish is fiber recovery. Obviously, that's an expensive part of the process uh, as far as the, uh, the, the material cost and, uh, and the end game. So we want to recover as much yield, uh, recover as much fiber, get the best yield that we possibly can. The other thing, when you think about introducing a board into a, a ripsaw, if the board is no good, it's warped, it's twisted, well, you can't expect the ripsaw to fix that. So, you know, board conditions matter. So we want to make sure that the material that we start with works, or is going to produce good material after I've processed it. And then, of course, the other consideration is safety. You know, over a table saw, as an example, with the anti-kickback fingers, uh, this, the, these types of saws are much, much safer. We don't have those type of concerns as far as boards coming back out of that saw. So to get into a little more detail about the rip saw, the machine, this particular model, comes in one blade or, or two blades moving. Um, so it gives me the ability to uh, have a very flexible uh, solution per board width. What that means is every board that we rip, you can see Gill is grabbing different boards and they have different widths. That's the number one defect of any uh, particular uh, uh, piece of lumber is whatever its shape is. The moving blade technology allows me to continually optimize that material and go from one setup to another setup per board. That's really the advantage of that system. Um, the laser lights on the, on the board, I don't know if you can see them. Some of you uh, can uh, see them better than others. But basically, the, those laser lights represent where the saw blades are. Uh, the lasers move with the moving saw blades as well as the fixed saw blades, saw blade or saw blades. And therefore, the operator can very quickly determine where to position that board on the end feet of that saw uh, so that it can feed through and, uh, and he can do that quickly. Typically, a saw like this with one, uh, with no infeed, uh, you're going to see some infeed solutions later on uh, this afternoon. You can process about one to two boards uh, per minute. So, what's what's the advantage? Why why consider something like this? Well, if you have a straight line rip saw as an example, obviously here I can get multiple rips out the back side in one pass. So it's very productive. Uh, you can process a lot more material in a shorter time. I alluded to it before, but you get a best solution per board. The more rip saw blades that you have, there's saws with three, four, five moving blades, depending on the size of company that you are. But the reality of it is, yeah, the more blades that you have, the more choices you have in terms of optimal solutions coming out the backside. The other thing that is, especially if you're making solid wood, uh, five-piece doors with solid wood panels, raised panels, or any other product where you have to do some clamping, a machine like this, whether it's one blade or two moving blades, gives you the ability to pick up random width. Further, uh, getting a better utilization of your material. So whatever that leftover material is on that board, within whatever given range that you want your staves to be in a panel, you have the flexibility to get that random width out of that. And that's a big, big advantage when it comes to yield. And then of course the saw has the ability to provide a glue line rip. So how do we do all of this? Well, on the controller, we have the ability to either uh, enter in cutlass into the, uh, into the saw, and basically we can uh, determine what we want for a width, what we want for quantity, and the saw will keep track of all that sort of stuff. It can either be entered manually, a USB uh, port, so you can bring information from the office, or if you want to download to it via ASCII file, you can do that. So you can have a direct link from your office if that was important to you. The other thing that the optimizer does, and this is, this is important to know, is that you have really two ways of optimizing. You can optimize with just yield in mind, where you're just trying to get the absolute most fiber that you possibly can, and everything is equal as far as the products that you're going you're gonna to make. Or you can also value optimize. And what that means is that gives me the ability, if I have a particular rip width that's more important to me than something else, 
that I go after that. I put a little bit higher value and then the optimization engine goes after that particular material. Having said all of that, you may need to override a solution. So in other words, the saw has the ability, once you put those factors in, once you decide how you want to run it, it'll create a solution and maybe you don't like it. Maybe the, the rip line is right between a knot, splitting the defect like we talked about before. Then the operator can override that to another solution, another solution, or if you want, you can manually decide how you want that to be uh, ripped and move those blades independently and so on. So, what, so uh, why consider a saw like this? Well, again, it's fast, productive, you can get a lot of material done. The yield advantages are huge. You're looking at typically three to five percent yield gains uh, conservatively on a machine like that. So depending on how much lumber you buy, three to five percent adds a lot to the bottom line. We keep talking about the bottom line. How many people in the audience raise your hand that you can, uh, anytime you want, raise your prices because you want your product or you want to make more money? Anybody? Really? Nice. Most of us, however, have to reduce our costs to try to increase and improve our bottom line. So one of the things, that's why we talk about yield, that's why we talk about recovery, productivity, and so on. And then, of course, the other benefit, we talked about the random width, the ability to recover that material and deal with that effectively. So there's some alternate, alternate solutions that you probably have heard about. You can have a straight line rip saw. Uh, that is gonna be a, you know, one saw blade, of course. Um, the two big advantages there are that we have the ability to eliminate having to buy straight line material. What you do that from somebody, typically it's 10, 12 cents a board foot. So obviously, a thousand board feet, feet, you save 100, 120 dollars a board foot. Again, adding to the bottom line. The only advantage of a straight line is that you can do some small parts. So if you want to do recovery and so on, but every time I want to make a rip, I have to make a minimum of two passes at least for that first rip uh, to get that um, uh, rip size uh, produced. Then we get into the multi-blade rip saws. Um, it's kind of a step between a straight line and a moving blade saw. And you know, if I have, let's say, some fixed rips that I do a lot of, um, the advantage of that saw is that in one pass I can get multiple rips, of course. I don't necessarily have the flexibility of the moving blade, but if, uh, if I don't have a lot of rip choices anyway, sometimes it doesn't make that much difference. I just set the arbor up accordingly. There's two versions of the way those machines are set up. One version is with spacers, a traditional spacer system where the blades are separated by spacers on an arbor and locked down. The other uh, system is what we call a uh, hydro arbor with an ETP sleeve. And that gives me the ability to hydraulically lock the blades in place so I literally can move them where I want on the arbor when I loosen it up lock it down hydraulically and then they're fixed. There's no spacers between the uh, saw blades. So although it's not fast enough to be able to go from board to board to board, it is fast and if all of a sudden my ripping uh, requirements change and I want to change that arbor. I don't have to disassemble that whole assembly uh, to do that. So again, why would I consider those types of saws? It's productive, it's safe. I can get a lot of production uh, through that saw, those types of saws. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on material handling going into a, into a uh, rip saw. Uh, Addison, my colleague, this afternoon uh, will be covering that. Uh, but there are different infeed solutions. As you can see, right now, Gil has to look at those laser lights, make a decision. One to two boards a minute is pretty good on average. And on the, uh, if I have an infeed solution, I can automatically measure that board. It'll automatically optimize that board. And I can feed up to typically about 10 boards a minute, even faster on a higher speed type line. But for the type of equipment that you're looking at today, 10 boards is about uh, what we're talking about. So more output, uh, better utilization of uh, um, automatically reading the board and um, 
and being able to feed a lot more uh, product through. You can certainly override, so when somebody tells you it's 10 boards a minute, but your operator is overriding every single board, well, obviously you're not gonna get 10 boards a minute. So uh, if, if it's in automatic mode, that's, that's when we talk about those board speeds. So the other thing <clears throat> that you can get out of a in-feed type system is statistics. So if you wanna keep track of the board count from your suppliers, keep them honest, you have the ability to do that because you're measuring that board footage as it's going into that, into that saw. So the edge prep, the glue line that you hear a lot about, the, there's really two things that are important, well, three things that are really about glue line, and that is that it's plus or minus, the standard in the industry is plus or minus four thousandths of an inch over eight feet, okay? So what that means is the waviness of the cut, I'm exaggerating, of course, can't be more than plus or minus four thousandths. So when those pieces mate together, there isn't excessive gap between them. Second of all, the other thing that we think about when we glue those panels together, those staves together, we don't want real wavy boards over a sixteenth of an inch gap to try to close that up because obviously they're stressing that board and now when we release that, they're stressing that joint and can cause failure. Another item that's really important is that the saw blade needs to be sharp. If I polish that surface, I'll have an issue. I do a lot in the sanding end. It's the same thing if I have a dull uh, sandpaper belt. I will polish that surface. My stain won't take. Well, glue is the same way. I want that surface to be receptive, open to being able to take that glue and adhere to it so that I don't have any joint failures. In addition, there's some other things that are important in terms of the process when you apply the glue. Seven to nine mils of glue is about what we, uh, we put on the edge to make sure that we have enough. We don't put too much, we don't put too little. We wanna make sure our material's not too dry, not too wet, you know, make sure that it's, uh, it's properly dried. The conditions of the plant where we're gluing up the material. I live in Wisconsin, you don't want to be uh, uh, trying to glue up panels in a warehouse that doesn't have any heat in the winter. So if it's below 55 degrees, you could have issues with adhesion uh, in that environment. You want to make sure that the environment is warm enough for that glue application. And second of, second of all, you want to make sure that the relative humidity is in that 25 to 45 percent range because wood is happy at that. If it's too dry, if it's too wet, uh, you can have issues. Jeremy and I are from different parts of the country. Jeremy's from Unique, which is in Arizona, and down there, a little dry, right? From time to time, it's pretty dry. Once in a while, it's wet. Up where I am, especially in the transition periods, in spring and in uh, fall, we have wet conditions. So all of those things have an impact on your process. So now we're gonna see if we can get Dave to start up the molder. And we'll talk about the lineal uh, profiling process. So when we think about profiling, we're thinking about, we're thinking about a couple of things. What my desired product is. In other words, what am I gonna do with that material? Is it moldings? Is it door stock, face frame stock? What does the condition of that material need to be like? Therefore, that goes into my setup of the machine, the tooling that I choose, so on and so forth. The other consideration is knife marks per inch. Depending on what products I'm making, some products are more particular and need a finer finish. Interior products is an example, maybe in that 16, 18, 20 knife marks per inch range. AWI as an example has actually spells those uh, out as far as the molding quality. If it's an exterior product, maybe not as fussy, maybe six or eight knife marks per inch. So making sure that you're matching your uh, process through the molder uh, to meet the product that you're uh, to the uh, customers. The other thing that you want to pay attention to, Hunter's going to talk a lot more about this later when we optimization, and that is that we want to match the material that we buy with the product that we're making. If I buy poor material, buy really good material, but I'm going to cut it up in pieces, maybe that's not such a wild thing. 
up even. products that you're running. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, insert tooling and so on. We're not going to spend a lot of time. But at the end, you want to make sure that you have the right tools on the machine to make sure that you're getting the right results. And then, of course, safety. You know, we want to make sure that we have a safe operating environment. So the molder, the Kentwood uh, molder that we have here, the 509S, it's a five-head machine. The big advantage of this machine is that I have the ability to do a couple of things. One, I can foreside profile my material. So I can get it to thickness, I can get it to width, I can put whatever profile I want and I can control that. I also have the ability to make sure that I, hit, I represent uh, from Monday to Tuesday to Friday accurate, repeatable um, profiles so that that cross section of whatever I'm making stays the same. You may have to run a product, whether it's a molding or whether it's a door style. You might have to run it on Monday and might have to resume running it for some reason on Wednesday. Well, you want to make sure that that product is consistent. So it gives me the ability to do that. And how it does that is we have the ability to uh, position the heads, both axially and radially, to make sure that they are in the right position. So yeah, as long as we know what the tool dimensions are, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute then I can go very quickly from one setup to the, to the other. Another feature that is nice on this machine is a system that we call Pro-Lock um, uh, Spindle uh, Locking. And essentially it's a system that's been around a long time. It's been on the Holtzma panel saws for quite a while. And it's a, uh, a bolt that is tightened onto a, a, a shaft by a set screw. The bolt gets loosened uh, out of that shaft the threads are internal, so when I put tools on and off, I don't have those exposed threads. It's very quick change from one thing to the next, and uh, it's a very reliable uh, system that's fast and easy to use. So basically, one of the things, you know, if we're talking again about what the benefits are, why should I consider a molder? One pass and done. I put a rip in, I have a finished product coming out. When I first started my sales career 20 some years ago, you know, they always said that molders made money. They printed money. Well, I don't know if it goes that far, but if you think about the value of that stick going in versus the value on the other end, it's very productive and it, and it adds a lot to the bottom line for a particular company. Again, the accurate cross sections, you have a lot better chance of controlling everything because it's in one machine as it's passing through and the flexibility that allows you to go from, you know, door stock. Uh, you're going to see, um, you're going to see David set up on uh, face frame material. So you have the ability to go from uh, different types of products, including moldings, different types of moldings for different customers, custom moldings. You can do a lot of different things. Can everybody still hear me good? Everybody good? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So there's other ways to do it. Unique makes a machine called the 410. It's a hopper fed, uh, small footprint machine. And if I wanted to take uh, S4S or S4S or even rip material, and I wanted to put a, a, a sticking profile on it with stack tooling ability, I can do that. In that situation, I'd have pre-cut material like Gil is doing here, and uh, we. Uh, um, can take that material and linearly profile it and then go to the coping after that. So if I want to process that in a little bit different way, uh, that we, uh, that, that's one other way that that, that can be done. 
One of the things that's new for us that's coming is the homemade uh, auto, uh, CNC automated positioning uh, molder. There's a couple of neat things about that. Some of the things we have on the uh, 509S behind us, the, the quick lock or the pro lock um, uh, quick change spindle will be incorporated. But we have the power touch controller, touch screen, intuitive. And if you noticed, if you were here yesterday, a lot of those controllers were, well, all those controllers uh, were on all the machines on the other side. So what's nice about that in your uh, particular plant, if you have uh, multiple machines from us going forward, all the controllers will essentially have the same type of platform. Obviously, there's different things on a molder than there are on an edge bander, but it's intuitively the same in terms of the, uh, the way it functions and operates with, uh, with gestures and ability to operate like your phone, uh, essentially. One of the things about that, just quickly, that I've kind of discovered, especially on the sanding side of things, because we incorporated in that a couple of years ago, is that the younger generation loves that. Um, they love that type of technology in terms of being able to operate it. So it's, it's definitely the right type of uh, uh, interface for the younger generation. So tooling, just a little bit about tooling. If I'm going to have stacked tools and I'm going to go from one thing to the next, i got to do some things to make it easier to do that. And <laughs> one of the things that I do is the axial adjustment, the axial adjustment of the tool. I want to make sure that if I'm going to stack tools that they're the same height so that I can go from one position to the other. And so that uh, I don't, I don't have any guesswork in terms of that positioning. I know exactly where that tool needs to go. I also want to make sure the radial dimension is the same, so I don't have any present, uh, positioning issues as far as in and out on a fence and so on, that it, it is at the uh, exact same spot from one tool to the other. As long as you do that kind of thing, you can very easily go from one setup to the other. If you've got a hodgepodge of tools, it's going to make that uh, a lot more difficult to do the uh, time to set up, of course, will be much longer. The other thing that you want to make sure you think about, especially with this kind of material here with a uh, sticking profile for door components and face frames, use insert tooling. Or in some cases, diamond if you run enough material and the right kind of material. Because that's what's going to ensure that every sharpening, you're going to, of course, have the same profile. You certainly do not want grindable tooling for that scenario. If you're doing a lot of custom profiles and so on, well then, in that particular case, a grindable tool is better because it's easier to uh, keep that sharp, it's easier to uh, uh, go from one thing to the next, it's easier to replace and regrind knives into something else from that perspective. So now I'm going to hand this over to Hunter, and he's going to talk about the cross-cutting, the coping, the uh, door assembly, and then the shaping and sanding. And then at the end, I'll finish up with him. Here you go, Hunter. All right. Everybody hear me all right? We're good? Thank you, Peter. Hi, my name is Hunter Ellison. Um, I work in the um, uh, E-Tech division of uh, styles, uh, specifically an ancillary. I'm going to walk you through the remaining processes of the five-piece door cell here. Uh, Peter spent uh, a, a good bit of time talking about making sure we have quality material that's ending up here on our crosscut table, going through the, the rip saw and the molder. And of course, our uh, press cutting process, why it's important, we gotta ensure that we're, we're you know, this is our, our opportunity to size our parts, make sure they're square, they're consistent, and that we're not ending up with uh, defect material down at our assembly table. So there's a, a number of important processes here. We're gonna talk about uh, optimization, um, um, opportunities to save money by dropping a grade in material, how to defect that material, ensuring our product is uh, square, and that we have quality material on our, on our cutting table. So there's many different ways to cross cut. Um, as you can see on the, on the screen, there's a, um, a manual solution here with just a, a typical cross cut saw. And uh, very common, most people have this in their manufacturing facilities. And it, it can be a, a, a very productive way to cross cut providing that you don't have a lot of changeover. What we see too often is um, an end user, an operator, 
who is maybe set up with a flip stop, and he's walking down to the end of the table here, and he's setting a measurement at, say, 50 inches. He's cutting that material, and he has to come back and measure that piece, make sure it's set up correctly, and maybe it's off by a little bit. He goes back, makes a small adjustment, makes another cut, measures it again. So that doesn't seem like a lot of effort, but multiply that over and over and over again throughout the day. Every time you have to change a part, five days a week and 12 months a year, and you can see there's a lot of footsteps involved, a lot of touching of the product. So a programmable positioner can, can give that operator um, a, a much easier way for setup. Also with the manual solution, you're going to typically see a lot lower yield than you would, um, no optimization available, and safety is something that comes up time and time again and something that we can't talk about enough. Each of the solutions that we're going to show you here keeps your operator's hands free and clear from the tool. So ultimately what we're looking for here is to keep material out of your trash bin. You guys are paying to bring it in, you're paying to haul it off. So cross cutting is, a, is an excellent um, opportunity to defect and increase your yield. And we're going to show you how to do that on the Tiger Stop. So as Peter mentioned, we are um, using an ironwood upcut saw and a Tiger Stop programmable positioner. Tiger Stop, I know a lot of you people in here already have them. For those that, that, that are not using a programmable positioner, the Tiger Stop is extremely fast, accurate, extremely easy to use. It can be set up as a push feed or it can be set up at a set point optimizing, which we're going to talk about. Zero setup time, which means your operator is just plugging in the position he needs, the fence is moving right to it, and he's doing exactly what Gil's doing here, standing in front of the machine and making cuts versus having to walk down and take measurements. So eliminating rework, many instances where um, 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 a set point has been put, set in place, a manual set point, and make a number of cuts that gets put on the cart, move down assembly, and you find out that you've got a, a large amount of material that was cut incorrectly. So coming back and, and, and doing that, the Tiger Stop is going to assist you in eliminating that rework. A Tiger Stop coined a phrase years ago called use your worst first. Um, the idea behind that is most operators, when they're, when they're cross-cutting, they're reaching right behind them or to the side and they're grabbing a fresh piece of material every time. But all around them, typically there's, there's drops behind the saw, in a bucket, usable material, but they're in a hurry. They don't have time to sort through it. They don't have time to measure it. So they're just grabbing the next piece and they end up cutting the longest piece first. They're working off a clipboard and they typically start with the long piece and work their way down. There's a better way to do this where we can increase your yield. So Tiger Stop and with the optimization software allows you to, in their words, use your worst first, where you can reach back and grab a drop out of, out of a bin, lay that up on the table, make a reference measurement. The Tiger Stop is going to ask you, what is your usable material? And if it's a, a 31 inch material, you type in 31 inches, and it's going to optimize. It's going to go through your entire cut list, and it's going to choose the part or the parts that makes the most sense out of that. So you're ultimately using all of your waste up, using your worst first, and increasing your yield. We've had customers empty an entire wall of drops by simply adding the optimization software to an existing Tiger Stop that they already have. So the cross-cutting process, it's also going to give you the opportunity to run a lower grade material. Um, we have a lot of end users who are using uh, clear grade material, um, usually for a couple of reasons. Uh, in some instances, you absolutely have to have four clear sides. But our process today, we're using a, a, a number one common. So going through and defecting this material versus buying a, um, an FAS material, you're talking about a considerable decrease in cost in material. And depending on the, the area of the country you're in, we've seen 20 to 30 percent difference between one common and FAS. So imagine that to your bottom line just by dropping the grade in lumber. Now, the Tiger Stop gives you a very simple way to defect, whereas you downloaded your cut list into the Tiger Stop, and you're simply going through, laying your material up, doing a head cut, and then measuring, taking a reference cut to the area of your, your first defect, entering that number into the Tiger Stop, and it's going to automatically optimize and decide for you what part or parts need to be cut. So your yield is increasing considerably quicker. 
So bottom line, you're eliminating uh, flip charts, cut sheets, and tape measures by adding a tiger stop. It's a very inexpensive addition to your current process. It can work with any crosscut saw. You can also add uh, print labels. So if you're defecting, your parts are going to come out in different order. So it's a, it's a quick way to make sure that when you get done, you can, you can sort each of your parts for the different um, uh, components of your cabinet manufacturing. So for end users that might need a higher capacity than say something that we're looking at right here today, well, I'm going to show you a couple of options that Styles offers that will assist you in your cross-cutting process. Tiger Stop is one of those options. They, uh, a few years ago, introduced a full automated optimizing crayon defect saw, where again, you're downloading your cut list into the Tiger Saw, but th in this instance, you're simply loading the part marking the defect with a crayon, hitting start, the material is scanned and it's pushed through, in cuts, tail cuts are made, and then it's gonna cut out the defect all along optimizing the best parts. Inkjet printing is also available where you can have the, the, the part name placed on each of the, the parts that are coming off the saw. For customers that might need even more um, um, feed through capacity, Salvador, uh, will offer up to 12,000 lineal feet. So it's a heavier saw, a little faster saw. We actually have this saw here. You're going to see it run a little later. It's on the other side of the room. The saw is, is also available in pack saw configurations as well as miter saw operations. Very flexible solutions. Inkjet printing. And above all, what we're talking about here is improving your yield and keeping material out of your trash bin. It's a cross-cutting process. We're looking for cracks, splits, knots, wane, um, resin holes, stains, all of these things we want to make sure we're pulling out right here. We went to great effort on, uh, on, on setting up our, our, our rip configuration and our molder to make sure we got quality material here and we need to pull all the defects out at our cross-cut station. So the next process, you guys may have been watching Jeremy. Jeremy is um, applying the coat profile. We've sized our styles and rails. He's applying the end coping. And we're using the unique 310 machine. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a double-sided option, which is what we're, we're using here. And then we've got a single-sided option we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, ultimately, we need to make sure these parts are square, clean cut, and we get a real, really, really nice fit. There's different ways um, to cope. Perhaps you've got a, a single station shaper with a mortise attachment, which is an excellent way to, to, uh, to cope. But we've seen some instances where maybe someone is using more of a T-square versus a cope where it's not really holding the part. The operator's hands get dangerously close to the tool. You'll see Jeremy, his hands are nowhere near the tool. It's a double-sided machine. It's got two spindles, one spindle on each side. The spindle on the right side of Jeremy is spinning in a counterclockwise motion. The spindle on the left side is spinning in a clockwise motion. So it's spinning, it's turning into the material, two phenolic chip breakers on the back that are going to ensure that we don't have any tear out on the back side. For instances where you're manufacturing um, process involves coping before you apply the rail mold. We applied our rail mold on the molder prior, cross cut, then cope. But in instances where maybe you're not using a molder, maybe you're applying your rail um, in a different manner, the uh, Unique 265 is a perfect, perfect um, uh, machine for this. The 310 that we're using right now is ideal for this type of scenario where a customer is going to pre mold their material. Excuse me. Turret tool positioning is available for both of these coat machines. Very flexible machines, so you can stack up to three different tools and switch quickly between those. And above all, it's extremely safe to operate. Again, Jeremy's hands are nowhere near the cutting surface. Uh, we know we have some customers here that are also um, building their own uh, miter doors. So Unique has two different solutions for uh, miter, miter door processing. Uh, the first is a finger joint model. And it's set up very similar to the 310 that we're running right here, except the fences obviously will be angled at a 45 degree angle. The material has to be sized, but it does not 
have to be mitered. So you can simply size the parts as we're doing here on the upcut saw and take them straight into the miter saw, place them in. The machine will hog, profile, and drill for a dowel in one pass. Very fast and again, very safe, really small footprint. For customers that might need a different type of miter joint where you're, where you're needing a blind joint, you don't want to see that, that uh, finger joint reveal on the top. Unique offers a 3450. Very easy machine to run, very flexible. It's a two, two station machine where you're, you're operating uh, pendulum processing, where you're loading two parts on one side, clamping, and then walking over and loading the other two parts while these two parts are processing. So the machine's designed um, in mind to where the operator isn't out running the machine, the machine is not out running the operator. It also has um, an easy, two easy buttons to where, for those of you who are, who are currently making mortise and tenon joints, to where the operator can loosen or tighten that joint on the fly. So looser or tighter buttons, every time you hit that button, it will loosen or tighten um, one thousandth of an inch. All right, so we've, we've cross-cutted, we've poked our parts, and now it's time to assemble our doors. Ryan is... Um, place right now assembling uh, face frames and doors and he's using using a unique model 280. Now you'll notice for those of you on this side of the table it's a perforated table so you can move the clamps around very easily very quickly for your different size doors. It's also fitted with an overarm bar as you'll see Ryan is, is uh, assembling our face frames right now. The machine's set up at a 60 degree angle so it takes up very little room. The machine's available in a three foot by six foot machine. It's also available all the way up to a 12 foot machine where you can have up to two to four stations. So we've assembled our doors. Jeremy is now applying uh, our edge profile detail to our finished doors. And we're doing that on the unique 422 shape and sand. This process is extremely important when we're talking about profiling and sanding. Um, Addison is going to spend uh, quite a bit of time with us this afternoon, uh, this, later this morning, talking about sanding, and the word you're going to hear is consistency. So what this machine does is we're applying our profile, and we're getting a consistent sand on all four sides of this of this board. So I encourage you, after we're done, to come down and see the finished product here and feel the ingrain on these doors and how smooth they are. Ultimately, what this machine will do for you is eliminate your profile sanding up to 90%, even higher in some instances. So as the, as the machine is running, Jeremy's going to feed this door. You'll see the first head, it's going to pop out. What's happening there is you've got two counter-rotating heads. So the first head is spinning into the material counterclockwise, moves out of the way once about four to six inches has been cut into it. The second shaper head is picking it up, and it's doing a climb cut, cl uh, clockwise cut. So it's it's going to compress the end grain as the, the door goes through. So it's going to eliminate any chance for blowout. So your operator doesn't have to worry about backing those doors up, and you can run the machine a little faster. We're running this machine at about 30 linear feet a minute. You can run up to 35 linear feet. It's very fast, very flexible. Again, stack tooling. We've got um, panel profile on this machine. We have edge profile, and we also have rail profile that you can run on this. But again, this machine, the value this, this machine is going to bring to you is the elimination of most of your profile sanding. You guys know what you're spending on profile sanding now. You know how many people you have that are standing around a table sanding. It's, it's, it's very time consuming, very expensive, and consistency is crucial. you got three or four or five different people. Everyone does it a little bit different. This machine is going to take care of your consistency issues. I'm going to hand this back over to Peter. He's going to do an overview for us. Thank you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Hunter. So, now what we want to talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit uh, earlier, is whether you should uh, outsource your doors or whether you should buy them. It all depends on your operation. Uh, there's different... Uh, different reasons to do both. And maybe you want to do a combination of, of uh, both. Maybe there's some doors you want to buy, maybe some doors that you want to make, as an example. So let's talk a little bit about why you might want to buy your doors. Well, probably the number one, the number two reasons, I would say, 
this, the first one is of course that you know your own, you know the costs. Obviously those costs aren't necessarily fixed, but you look in the catalog, you get a quote from a supplier, you know what that is so that you can bid that in and you know that that number is, is solid, you just mark it up accordingly. So that's certainly a, a valid reason. Maybe another good reason is that some of these door companies, the product offering that they, uh, that they offer is really wide. Some of those uh, catalogs are inch and a half, two inches thick of different types of door products that you can buy. If you're a smaller shop, there's no way that you could gear up to make all those different kinds of products. Another example of why you might want to buy doors is maybe you have issues with labor. Anybody here have any problems finding people? Obviously, that's not a funny subject these days. That's a very challenging uh, uh, topic as we, uh, the last couple of days, we spent quite a, bit, quite a bit of time talking about that. So maybe you have all you can do to keep your normal production going. On top of that, maybe you want your people to stay focused on what they do. You're good at something. You want to stay good at doing that. So you want to remain sharp and focused on that particular product. You don't want to worry about another process. Another real concern is uh, space. Obviously, this doesn't take up a whole lot of space, but maybe you don't have that space to, do, uh, to uh, uh, allow that to happen in your facility. Maybe you're already uh, starved for space. You just don't have enough room to do that process. But on the other hand, why would you want to consider making your own doors? Well, you can control your own lead time. That might be an issue. If I'm relying on somebody else to make my doors for me, they have their own production schedules. They have their own uh, priorities. Maybe you get the product when you need it, maybe you don't. So controlling that, of course, is, is important. You have the ability to control your own waste, right? You're paying for somebody else's waste and have no ability to control that. You have the ability to control your own quality. Since you're taking responsibility and it's being done in your facility, you can ensure that your customers are getting the product that you want. Not to say that sub-suppliers aren't producing a good quality, but obviously you have the ability to control that if it is in-house. Uh, yeah, like I said, th those, are, those are the main reasons that people would think about bringing it. But another thing that is important to think about is that maybe these doors here that we're making are pretty simple. You'll see some door cells in a little bit. Doesn't take up a lot of floor space to make some simple doors. So another strategy might be, you know what? I do 60, 80% of my production is a simple door. Maybe I bring that particular material in-house and then I outsource the more complicated things, giving my customers more opportunity to get different types of products that are difficult for me to uh, dif difficult for me to make. So when we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about material, we're talking about labor, we're talking about flow and process. Material is a big thing, as uh, Hunter was talking about. If I have the ability to optimize and defect my material, that changes the game completely for you. If we're manually cutting. Uh, and we're, even if we're just using a tiger stop as just a positioning stop, it's very difficult for an operator to really optimize around defects. So if, they, if you buy number one common as an example, in that scenario, your waste could go out of the roof. But since I can manage that with some different types of solutions like we showed you today, it allows me to bring in lower grade material and if, if you think about it that from, if you look at the size of the parts all around here, there are small parts. So it allows me to cut around those defects and utilize that material more effectively. A common strategy in the uh, cabinet world is to buy 10, 20% selector better. That allows me to do moldings. It allows me to do long face frame parts. But then the rest of that mix could be like a number one common as an example. The advantage of that is that now I'm buying a lower grade material because I'm going to cut uh, smaller pieces out of it anyway. So why pay for long, clean lengths if I can better utilize my material? Labor is a big component. I love this cartoon. I think we all can relate to it. 
Essentially, we've got two guys working extremely hard. They're busy to get those uh, pile of boulders to wherever they're taking them. You notice the cart's got square wheels, and the guy is offering him a wheel, and the guy says, oh, no, no, I'm just too busy, right? Well, we, we operate that way a lot of times. We, we want to make sure that we're doing things effectively. We're utilizing labor, you know, properly. And, you know, that's something that, um, are you cross-training your people? Are they, are they flexible? Can they go from one machine to another? Does that, uh, does that work in your facility? Are you spending time training them? The other thing that is kind of an interesting thought is that every single operation has a certain level of competency required to be effective at it. So in your shop, you have all different levels of capability, competency. Yet you have a very low, uh, pro low skill position, but yet a high skill person is doing it. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So we want to make sure that we're matching the process with the appropriate staff to take care of that uh, that particular situation. The other thing that I've got on the slide that I think is kind of interesting uh, is, you know, are your people happy? One of the things that is important today is retaining people, good people especially, right? So, you know, is the, is the environment, is it a good place to work? Those are all things that are concerns of uh, certainly business owners, and you want to make sure that your people are content so that you can hang on to them so you don't have to retrain new people. And retention is a very big uh, concern today because at the uh, employment rates that we're looking at today, they, those people just don't exist. It's just hard to find people. I love this uh, toolbox. It represents to me an organized production flow back in the 1890s. This was made by a gentleman in Massachusetts area uh, around that time. And he had everything in that toolbox he needed to process anything he needed on a job site, right? And that's also some of the mindset in terms of your shop. How flexible is the shop? Do you have all the tools that you need? Is it organized? Can I, can I quickly go from one thing to the next? Those things are important. And so you want to make sure that you have the people trained, you have the right material, and you have everything uh, that you need to be flexible and agile in today's world. There are really two things that I think are important to go back and, and look at your particular operations. And I'll give you an example, a personal example. How many steps people are taking to process material? I was at a, uh, I took a little sabbatical between sales jobs a while back, and I was in a shop that had uh, 75 feet wide, it was 300 feet long. The gentleman that made the uh, drawer boxes, they did everything themselves. They were their own rough mill, their own machining, cut to size, assembly, the whole nine yards. In that space of 75 by 300, how long do you think it took them? How many steps do you think it took them? How far did they walk to make a drawer front? Any idea? Quarter of a mile when I looked at it. Think about that for a second. The reason I went through that process is I wanted to illustrate the fact that those steps are money, right? It, let's, let's think about this a little bit differently. So analyze your operation. See how long they're going. How many, how many touches are they, uh, are they handling that, that stuff? You want to reduce that. That's all non-value added time. So we're going to talk a, about a few door cells. I made a few uh, assumptions in these cells. The door that we're talking about in the, in the example is a one foot by two foot door, two board feet. It uh, uh, has, uh, we're looking at an eight hour shift at 80% efficiency. I did not count in the raised panel. So talking about a flat panel door as an example. So I didn't account for that labor. And then I used a labor rate of $20 an hour, probably low, but just to give you a general idea as far as uh, uh, costs and so on. So the first cell here is just a simple cell. I was alluding to it before that if you wanted to just make simple style rail doors, you could do that with very simple equipment. You could have a straight line rip saw, you could have a tiger stop and an upcut saw so that you have some optimization, defecting capability, accurate parts. 
Uh, the machine isn't here, but Unique makes a 250 drawer machine. It's really one of their iconic uh, machines that they make. And you can stick material, do the lineal profiling. You can cope it, you can do arches, you can do raised panels. You can literally do everything on that machine for the door processing. And then the last but not least, of course, is a uh, clamp. That's a very you know, standard uh, thing in most cabinet shops, uh, but you need that, obviously, to make the doors. So the bottom line is two people can make 125 doors with that equipment in a shift, and it takes up about 750 square feet, and the cost is around 70, 70 $75,000, so not a big expense, so depending on how many doors you're buying, that ROI and that could be quite good. The next cell is, has more capability. We can introduce miter doors into the cell. We have more capability with a CML rip saw so that we take advantage not only of the cross-cutting optimization that we talked about before, but now I can bring the ripping optimization into the, into the picture. We have a couple of different ways for machining. We have a, a 250 door machine, so if I did need to do some arching or cathedrals, not in fashion today, or some raised panels, I have the ability to do that quite easily. But then I also have the ability to coat my material faster with the 310 machine. And I also introduce a 3450 for mortise and tenon uh, miter doors. So now that gets brought into the mix. So I have a bigger variety of product that I can offer my customers. It's going to take more money. It's going to take more people. But in the end, I have more capability. So a cell like that can produce, uh, in 3,200 square feet, about 550 doors with five people. So you can get a lot of production out the door if you needed to do that. This is just, we're going to see this at some point in the near future, I truly believe. One of the things that, this is just kind of an interesting concept where you have a couple of molders, CNC positioning molders, that can go from one thing to the next quite quickly. If we're running moldings, that material can be ejected off to the side. If it's going to get cut into parts, whether it's face frame parts or door parts, to go through a scanner, you say, well, a scanner doesn't seem like it would make sense. Believe it or not, <coughs> the ROI does make sense. And why that is, is because the linear foot price of that profile material is much more expensive than the raw material, right? So if I'm going to make accurate parts, and eventually those parts are going to go through single end machine uh, type machines for end work, or they're going to go into assemblies, they need to be accurate. They can go into push cut saws like you see there, two of them. The material for face frames could get sorted out onto those belts. The, uh, the styles for the door components could get sorted out. The random width could get sorted out. If uh, you were running uh, S4S material, probably wouldn't run it on a line like that. And then you also could have a, uh, uh, different types of coping solutions attached to that line so that in one continuous flow, you can process all your components. So literally, you, in 19,000 square feet, you could do 4,000 plus doors with 10 people. So why that all, if we bring that all together, if you look at the column on the right, what effectively happened in each one of those scenarios is the labor cost per door went down. The simple cell, $2.56 per door. Still not bad, but of course not the same as 40 cents a door for the uh, for that high production cell. Obviously different costs, it has to be scalable for what you're doing, but you can see that there's different opportunities there uh, for your particular operation. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have David, while we were running the cell, he was setting up on the face frame like I was telling you. And he's all ready to go, so the last thing we'll do is we'll just have him fire up the molder. We'll run a couple of sticks of face frame for you and then we'll conclude the program. So the changeover was quick because of technology like that Prolock spindle. He knows where the position of his tools need to be because they've been properly measured, and so he can go from one thing to the next quite quickly. As I don't know how many people were paying attention, but it was fairly effortless and quick to go from that uh, uh, door style that he was set up on to that face frame uh, product.
So anyway, we will conclude now at 10 o'clock. Addison Fox, my colleague, will be talking about sanding for dollars. And he's going to take these doors starting out. He's going to calibrate, sand them for you, finish sand, orbital sand. Then he's going to talk about veneer sanding, sealer sanding, and I think you'll enjoy that. So that starts at 10 o'clock over here. Please be ready to go when, uh, when that uh, time comes around. And thank you very much.